Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Grace Kang, Director of Communications at Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, PEER. And on behalf of PEER, as well as the EERI Northern California chapter, I'd like to welcome you all to this afternoon's EERI Distinguished Lecture, Cities, Earthquakes, and Time, by Dr. Robert Olshansky, Professor and Head at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. This program is being webcast live from 250 Sutarja Dai Hall on the UC Berkeley campus, and a video of the presentation will be posted on Pierre's YouTube channel for later viewing. For the attendees who are here in person, I'd like to invite you to a reception after this talk, which will be held upstairs at the Pierre, at the Pierre office at 325 Davis Hall. To get there, you go upstairs, you go outside to the Campanile side of Davis Hall, and you enter the exterior door there. So we welcome you to join us there. Um, at this point, I would like to uh, uh, hand the podium over to Rich Eisner, who will introduce Dr. Olshansky. Welcome on behalf of EERI and PEER. And uh, I have known Dr. Olshansky for a number of years and when he was a student here at Berkeley and as well as afterwards professionally. His work is focused primarily on the urban planning aspects of disasters, including earthquakes and floods and uh, other uh, natural events, and focusing on the period of recovery and what, what makes good, effective recovery, actually builds housing, builds shelter, helps communities restore themselves. Um, and I'm, no, I'm not going to use the resilience word because it's, it's become a cachet rather than a really meaningful description of the process, either before or afterwards. Uh, Dr. Olshansky has studied earthquake recovery in Japan, in, in Kobe, and in Tohoku, Tofu, and in, as well as uh, elsewhere, as well as floods in New Orleans. Uh, he is probably the expert on recovery and reconstruction. and. Uh, I think reflects a unique aspect of what EERI is about, which is multidisciplinary integration of planning, engineering, architecture, uh, economics, and sociology in earthquake disasters. So, Rob? Hey, thanks. I think I'm here. Is this yeah, on? You're wired. Okay, I'm wired, and you guys can hear me anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my... Uh, seventh in the series of the Distinguished Lecture Tour this year. Um, but uh, I, did one in, I did one last week at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, so there were familiar faces there. But other than that, um, there's a lot of familiar faces here today. It's always good to be back in Berkeley, which I left almost 30 years ago. Um, so it's nice to be here. And uh, Rich reminds me it's big game week, so go Bears. Um, Okay, and on to the talk. So let's see. Um, so earthquakes happen in an instant, uh, but their effects stretch over time, um, and as well as the actions that we take to reduce their effects. And so today what I want to do is explore some of the characteristics of this relationship between earthquakes and time. Uh, more importantly, I want to talk about how these various time characteristics affect policy decisions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw four policy conclusions from this rumination on time. I think the first one is probably pretty familiar to most of you, um, but you might have thought a little less about the other three. So let's move on to time phenomenon number one, which is that earthquakes occur with no warning. So we know this. Um, but I want to remind all of you that this is really the most significant characteristic of earthquakes, and it's really at the heart of why earthquakes are unique as a natural hazard. Um, so I know in this crowd the answer I'm going to get, have any of you experienced a large earthquake? There should be a, at least a few hands here. So uh, let's see. We'll, we'll pick out a, a couple here. Um, if somebody wants to volunteer, when, uh, when did it happen and what were you doing? But it was early in the morning, yes. Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> and so, um, and so what was your thought at the moment that that happened? It did not occur to me to jump out of bed and get clear of it. It, it just didn't feel to me as though it was worth worrying about too much. Okay. Um, 
this might have been faulty thinking, but <laughs> Obviously. I was okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, but it, but it was a, and you felt earthquakes before, so you knew yeah. exactly what it was. Yeah. Uh, but still, it's sort of a surprise at that moment, mm -hmm. I imagine. Okay. Um, others? Rich is sitting right there. <laughs> I was asleep, and it was Northridge. And you could hear it coming before the building started to shake. It was a oh. single-family house, oh. and it went on and on and on. And uh, it, 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 was, it was not the first earthquake I'd felt. I felt the one in the mid-early 50s in Southern California. Um, they're just terrifying. It's like there's, there's powers that you can't control. You just ride it out. Right, and so, and again, you know about this, but suddenly there, it, there it was, and it was very frightening. Okay, and we'll, let's grab one or two others here. Hi, Rob. Hey, uh, Loma Prieta, '89. I was driving to a meeting on Highway 280, and uh, the road kind of buckled a little. And everybody got out of their cars to check their tires. Everybody <laughs> thought they had flat tires. Because huh. when you're in a car, it just feels like your car is sort of swaying. And we looked out the window and thought there couldn't be 2,000 flat tires all at the same moment. Yeah. And then the World Series went off. So. Yeah. And so what was your thought at the time? So you were just, you were just driving on your way someplace? We, we, we knew immediately kind of because we had the radio on for the World Series. And so we started hearing stuff right right away so yeah. we kind of we kind of knew a bit but all we knew it was you know something we knew it was an earthquake we didn't know where or, you know how extensive yeah uh because we have uh, one more here there we go uh, in 1971 uh, in the san fernando earthquake i was in a brick dormitory at cal poly pomona dorms and uh woke to the sound of my large reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder on my brick and board bookshelves right over my head, rocking back and forth, and I suspected I might get up at that point before it dinged my head and went out to the hallway and watched this brick uh, structure wave back and forth. And uh, But that's uh, quite interesting for a young civil engineering student to see a uh, real earthquake action face-to-face. Uh, yeah, and again, so you were so you were in bed, and but then, but this was it, again was quite a it was a surprise. Yes. Suddenly, here it was, the earthquake happening. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. Um, uh, well, we have one more. Oh, okay. Um, that's that's that, that's fine. Um, and actually, I've I I have um, similar tales from most of the same ones, but I wasn't in Kobe in 1995, so I don't have that. Um, anyway, so so we listened to. Um, uh, what the what earthquakes feel like they 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 you know happen suddenly you're doing something else and suddenly there it was and so I want to contrast that to the way that that we talk about earthquakes um, in terms of, of probabilities we usually talk about there's a certain percent chance of some level of shaking in 50 years there's a certain percent chance of an earthquake occurring in 30 years it's sort of the typical estimates that they give here in the Bay Area um, we will often talk about the very real possibility that an earthquake might happen tomorrow, um, so we really need to be ready for it, um, or later today, or something like that. But none of these things quite reflects the reality of earthquakes as we were just describing it. Um, so the question I have here is, when does an earthquake actually occur? And, well, some of you heard this talk before, um, but the answer is now. And not very profound, um, but this is, this is everybody's experience when it happens. It happens now. It doesn't happen soon. It doesn't, in fact, happen tomorrow. It doesn't happen later today. But when an earthquake happens, it happens right now when you least expect it, and it's really annoying when it does. Uh, <laughs> And I, again, I've, I've, I've been through this, and I, and I know about this, and suddenly there it is, and I'm thinking, you know, I know what this is, and this is not what I wanted to happen today. You're certainly right now. Um, so it's this characteristic that makes mitigation so essential. Hurricanes, in contrast, happen tomorrow, or they happen the day after tomorrow. Actually, more accurately these days, hurricanes probably happen 
our predicting abilities. That happened maybe two days from now or three days from now. Um, and that gives us time to evacuate or to take other precautions. Even tsunamis happen in a few minutes or hours from now. Even the ones that are near field, there is some warning. Um, but earthquake shaking itself, it happens right now at this instant. And if the highest priority goal is to save lives, and I, and I agree that it is, we can only do this by making the structures safe enough ready for that moment of the earthquake, because there's nothing you can do when it starts to shake. So I think we all agree that this is important, but it also biases our thinking in several ways. Because of this overwhelming nowness of earthquakes, most people, and I include myself, um, think when you think of an earthquake, I think of it as primarily a moment in time, as something like this in Christchurch perhaps followed by minutes or hours afterward. Um, engineers are trained to think of the moment of the earthquake, and they evaluate their success by measuring the structural performance immediately afterward. Um, so here, one of the EERI reconnaissance uh, was designed, was the objective, certainly in this slide, was to evaluate the, the performance of those buildings at the moment of the earthquake. Um, typically, reconnaissance trips by EERI members and colleagues are scheduled as soon as possible after earthquakes, and they should be, in order to capture both the structural and the geological phenomena that occurred at the moment of the quake. Um, and that's all important. But then, afterwards, after the rescues, after the funerals, the effects of the earthquake stretch on for months and years sometimes even decades. And this is really the time frame of the economic effects of earthquakes. So people lose their livelihoods, they change jobs, um, they might move their place of residence. New economic stresses appear, new personal stresses arise. Eventually people rebuild their businesses, uh, pre-earthquake economic networks reconnect, um, maybe new ones form, social networks self-organize to heal. So our initial mental picture of an earthquake is of the physical damage. Um, but remember that buildings aren't really what make a city what it is. Above all, cities are economic and social systems. That's, that's why they exist. A city exists because it puts people in close proximity to each other to conduct economic transactions, to efficiently meet their material needs. And, uh, and, and then social networks help us to solve problems collectively and to help share experiences and culture. So this is really the reason why cities exist. And the, the, the material city, the city that we can see, is really just the physical manifestation of these economic and social networks. So we have buildings to provide shelter, uh, shelter from the weather. We have walls to provide privacy, to help to shape social interactions. We have transportation systems are really key. Um, they provide the mutual access that's really the city's reason for being in the first place. And then, of course, we have other infrastructure systems to support human needs. So these cities, physically destroyed by earthquakes and by subsequent fires, they still existed and functioned as cities at the time of these photos because their social, economic, political, and legal systems still remained. Uh, there were deaths, but, um, you know, but... Uh, most of the people were still there, and they still had connections with other people, and still in their minds, this city was still there. Um, and so after the earthquake, all the residents um, typically then wish that the physical city um, that supports them could be reconstructed immediately exactly as it was, precisely articulating the structure of the society that they still sense as existing, and, in, and that indeed still does exist at the time. Uh, so, you know, we, often we look at these pictures and, and, you know, there's this idea that everything is gone, that there's a blank slate and so on, and, and that, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. The city is still there. It's still in the people's minds. They still have um, attachment to place. They still, um, they're really, well, they still own all the property that's there. All of those things are still there. Um, so the city does still exist. It's just the physical part is missing. Um, but it always... It always takes a while to rebuild, uh, which can be frustrating. And so this is really the second aspect of time I want to look at, is that the earthquake is instantaneous, but the recovery is slow, which frustrates residents. 
And so we'll look at time phenomenon number two. Although it takes an instant to break everything, it takes a long time to fix them. And I'm going to argue here that it's okay for it to take a long time. So, um, so residents resist this slowness of rebuilding because it, it contrasts with that instant of destruction. Um, they, they want to return to what things were like the day before the quake. They want to return to it now. Um, you know, there's the, again, there's this significant contrast. You're, you're thinking of the, um, you're imagining, well, as we heard in the accounts here, everything is all normal, and then suddenly there's that moment when everything changes and people wish that they can, they can go back through time or they can get back to that moment as quickly and easily as possible. Um, and planners and engineers, of course, want to help them by rebuilding as quickly as possible while also building well. But what I want to, I want to caution here against haste. And again, I want to argue that it's okay if it takes a while to rebuild. And here's why. So remember, cities are, are complex things. Um, uh, there's many actors involved in the city, many um, interrelated and, and hierarchical layers of social systems and physical systems. Um, the old saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. And as much as we would like, it can't be rebuilt in a day either. And this is because there's many different people and different organizations that are involved in rebuilding the city, all with different goals. They all want to move quickly, but they can't all do it at the same time in a coordinated way. Um, government is one of those recovery actors. It, it is just one of them. There's everybody else involved. But I think government is a particularly important one because it can provide technical assistance, information, coordination, and very importantly, um, typically large amounts of money. So governments typically focus this money on infrastructure and on rebuilding housing, which are two important and highly visible aspects of reconstruction. And for them, it's tempting to set numerical goals that are easy to measure in rebuilding these things. One of the most common is the number of housing units per month or housing units per year of some unit of time. And it's, it's a very easy benchmark for, for government, um, for the public, for donor agencies, also for the press to use in evaluating recovery. And, well, stated another way, it's a convenient measure for politicians who want to take credit for things, for the press who want to blame government for things, and even for um, non-governmental organizations who want to score quick photo ops before moving on to the next disaster. But it turns out looking at, at housing units over time is actually a very poor indicator of recovery success. Um, for example, they might be, so you can build them quickly, but they might be the wrong types of housing units. And again, all these, all, all of the, um, uh, examples here are all things that I've, I've seen. So they sometimes are the wrong types of housing units. Um, they might be in the wrong place. They might not be accessible to livelihoods and support services, which again, the reason for the city existing is, is for this mutual access. And if you build the new housing in places that doesn't do what it's supposed to do, then they're just boxes with people in them, but they aren't really they aren't functioning to help people access the services in the city, um, which means they might not help to reactivate the social and economic networks. And finally, they just simply might not be what the residents want. Um, often we get them built in the wrong style, something that um, doesn't reflect the local culture, um, and it's just, it's just not, not what they want. So I think we need to remember that the real goal is to restore and create households and communities, and often focusing too narrowly on simply building houses quickly can drive governments to be hasty, thereby creating some of those ill effects that we just saw in the previous slide and making costly mistakes. So from evidence I know directly uh, from cases in, in Kobe, uh, in Sichuan Province, China, in Gujarat, and Tamil Nadu, India, Turkey, and Indonesia, we know that residents have a variety of needs and priorities, and they don't necessarily just want housing units produced as fast as possible. There's other things, that, other goals that they have. Uh, and we'll just kind of go through a couple of examples here. Um, so here in Kobe, the, um, the numerical housing goal was met. What they, they had set shortly after the earthquake, set a goal of 80,000 publicly financed units within three years. 
um, which they did. They succeeded doing that, and actually it was then exceeded within four years. So they actually ended up overbuilding um, more than the ambitious goal of 80,000 units. But the distribution of the housing was, was uneven. So as you can, um, well, for one, so the private investment tended to be in the uh, higher income areas. Um, and what you can see here, this is the um, various wards of Kobe, generally speaking, um, from left to right, going from west to east. And the, uh, the red bars there are the housing that was lost in the earthquake. The blue bars are the housing starts. And you can see that um, they certainly, on all the wards to the, um, to the east, they, they built a lot more housing than was lost. And that's because these are wealthier areas and there was more private investment there. Um, the uh, Nagata ward, which was the ward that was the most severely um, affected by the earthquake, lost the most housing units, um, never, didn't replace them all. So a lot of those people, uh, those households, they ended up going someplace else rather than back to the same part of town they were uh, before. And, um, and so the private low-cost housing, though, for, which is actually a lot of those people in Nagata Ward, was not rebuilt. And so many elderly and low-income households had to move to public housing. And then even here, um, a lot of the public housing wasn't built where it was most needed or mixed with other community uses. And so here's one area where they built a lot of it because the, it was convenient location. They were able to rebuild a lot of this housing quickly. Um, uh, basically, it was just expedient to be able to do so. But it, 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 ha it has poor transit access. It's a little better now. Um, lack of convenient retail centers, and it's a little better now, but this is 20 years later. Um, but it's still not the, not the best place. And so it, it turns out that the, um, this three-year numerical housing goal wasn't really the right goal. And I can say that um, I've, I've talked many times to the person who was in charge uh, of of this process. He was the, the housing director at the time in Kobe, um, and he was really proud of what he did. Um, you know, he was given this great challenge of, of, of rebuilding the 80,000 housing units in three years, and he worked, you know, day and night to do so, and we achieved that goal after three years. He was, he was certainly rightfully proud of it. It was a highlight of his professional career, and pretty much every day since then, he's been saying, but it wasn't the right goal. Um, because in doing it, they had to ignore so many other of these important factors in rebuilding communities. Um, the 2008 Wenchuan, uh, China earthquake, uh, it was in May 2008. Uh, in August, they came with this national plan for construction of over 4 million housing units, which is a huge number, unless you're from China, I guess, but it sounds like a big number to me. 90% um, of it was complete by the end of 2010. So this is pretty amazing physical reconstruction. Um, it's easy to see, uh, fast physical recovery. All these towns were rebuilt in a short amount of time. But the livelihood recovery was slow, especially in the rural areas. Um, economic development, they um, basically all the different towns, they, they base the economic development on the assumption of, of tourism, which I think to some degree is, is useful, but it's, it's, um, it seemed a little simple, and, and I think most of us um, have trouble believing that all of those towns are going to be able to survive on tourism alone. But there has to be more to the economy. And there are several industrial parks were planned, but few companies moved into them. So the, the goal here was to rebuild the housing. Um, there were some simple models of how they were going to do um, economic development, um, but not very effective. So in Tamil Nadu, India, after the um, Indian Ocean tsunami, uh, most, again, most of the new housing was completed within three years of the tsunami. But Again, in this example, we'll see that housing is not as important as livelihoods. These are coastal fishing communities, and they need to be close to their boats and close to their nets. The, the men need to um, stay close to the boats. They need to mend the nets all the time. Uh, the, the, the women uh, are the ones who dry and process the fish and carry them off to market, and it all needs to be done fairly close by. But they rebuilt the housing a kilometer inland, um, and... As a result, most owners didn't move into the, to the new housing, primarily because it was too far from the sea. Uh, in some cases, they were dissatisfied with the construction quality. In a lot of cases, they were dissatisfied with the housing design, that they were dramatically different than the traditional houses that they had in the area. 
So um, in many of these cases, we know that the residents would, in fact, prefer to wait a little bit longer to get housing that better suits their needs. So when governments believe that the speed of construction is the topmost priority, the, the way that they generally do this is by shortchanging meaningful citizen involvement. But the more cases I study, the clearer it becomes to me, um, and this is true in all these different places in the world, there's nothing unique, culturally unique about any of this, it seems to me that involvement is what the citizens want most of all. So here's a quote I like from a, a 2005 report um, for the Prevention Consortium after the Indian Ocean tsunami, which says, there is accumulated evidence uh, that people affected by disasters want to participate fully in the response, even if this means a slower implementation process. So there's case after case where they're, they're willing to slow it down as long as they were really involved in their opinions um, and, and uh, were, were respected. In fact, virtually every recent disaster recovery case tells us that housing reconstruction works best when the residents are actively involved. So what, the way, what I read into all this is what I think residents want most of all is to be heard. Again, this is not, it's, it's not that hard. They just want to be heard, they want to be listened to, they want to be taken seriously. They know what types of homes and communities they want to live in and they want to work in. They know where they want to be, they know how they want to access their work and their social networks. They don't want officials to rebuild as quickly as possible if it means ignoring them in the process of doing so. They want to be full partners. But what, to me, what's important is to do this well requires intention. Um, information and technical assistance cost money. Um, they need to be important parts of the initial reconstruction budgets and work plans. So we need to plan this stuff in from the beginning. The goal is to rebuild communities, reestablish livelihoods, try to make them better, safer, better infrastructure, with modern amenities, better urban design, new schools, new public facilities. And for this, we need to give voice to the residents in order to do it. They need to be partners with the government, partners with the aid agencies, and partners with the infrastructure providers. And so again, this means that how you organize the institutions of reconstruction becomes critical. So again, I'm not saying you know we should just slow down just because. I mean, speed is really important. Um, and yes, we need to secure funds as quickly as possible to do so. But empowering and supporting all the stakeholders to rebuild on their own is critical to successful recovery. So my restated version of time phenomenon number two um, is that we need to intentionally empower stakeholders. And, and if you do that, uh, it's okay if it takes a bit longer to rebuild. So... Let's move on to time phenomenon number three, which is that earthquakes repeat themselves over time. And I guess you, cry, you probably know this one too. Um, and it's really at the heart of the role of earth scientists in earthquake risk reduction. Um, we usually use this understanding to persuade people in active seismic areas to think about the next earthquake and to prepare for it, to remind them that there's another earthquake coming in the future, and that it'll strike with no warning in some future moment in time. But I want to remind you that this also means that we need to think about not just the next earthquake, but also the earthquake after that. And thinking along these lines um, really starts to, well, I think all of these have policy implications, but I think if you really start thinking about the earthquake after the next one, it suggests a lot of things. It means that not only do we need to to need to think about accomplishing as much risk reduction as possible now, but we also need to think about how we'll do this when we rebuild after the next earthquake and after the one after that. So the process that we think ahead now about the process of rebuilding, and part of that process of rebuilding is going to involve um, thinking ahead about reducing risk for the next one. Um, so when we do earthquake scenarios, we need to think about the world that will exist after the next earthquake and make sure that even if we can't prevent all the damages, we can ensure that the basic functions of the urban system will survive and facilitate long-term recovery. Um, yeah, we need to think about, again, the idea of continuous improvement in our urban construction processes 
as a long-term process. So a lot of times we do these scenarios, and again, we do think about that moment, we think about response. We may start to think about recovery, but, um, but not often enough do we think about the weeks, months, years that are gonna transpire afterwards, and the way that the city is gonna function during that time period, and, and how we can strategically think about helping the city to function better during that time period, how we can take actions now to make that work better, and then furthermore, how we can um, uh, set a framework now so that we can do more mitigation and risk reduction during that time period. This is really the essence, I think, of the concept of resilience. Now, I have the same feelings about it that Rich has, and I didn't, it's not in the title of my talk, um, but, um, but I, I have snuck in through the back door here and introduced the idea of resilience. Um, and I, I, think, I think, you know, it's about thinking about how to successfully withstand and recover from a disaster and then getting ready to do it again after that. It means that we need to design structures and infrastructure not just to survive that moment of the earthquake, but also to survive and to support the months and years of the reconstruction process, which in turn will also anticipate the next earthquake that's going to happen after that. This approach forces us to think less about the physical functions of the city and more about the social and economic purposes of the structures and infrastructure in supporting the life of the city to do what it does. Uh, again, it's maintaining the functions and operation of the city, of the economic networks, the social networks, and the physical things that support them is really the goal. So this idea has various implications. It involves thinking in the long term, accepting that some level of earthquake losses are inevitable, um, and continuously adapting and adjusting to changing conditions. Again, it's about thinking about the city as a system that evolves and changes over time. It's a process and a way of thinking rather than a measurable endpoint. Last one, time phenomenon number four. Um, structural standards should consider time. So this idea of resilience necessarily forces us to rethink traditional philosophies of building standards. The building code focuses on the moment of the earthquake, ensuring that the shaking does not cause the building to collapse and kill its occupants. Um, and again, this is the life safety standard and no complaint that that should be the top priority. But the limitation of the life safety standard is that it doesn't consider what transpires after the shaking stops. So code compliant buildings can save lives, uh, but they're often so severely damaged that they can't serve their intended functions. To repair them takes considerable time and money. Often, as occurred in the Christchurch Central Business District, the owners can't find timely financing, they end up demolishing the buildings instead of repairing them, and the result is an empty business district, the effects of which will ripple throughout the economy. And another example, steel frame buildings that survived the 1994 Northridge earthquake served their important life safety function once, but they weren't fit to withstand a subsequent earthquake. And so these two required subsequent repairs. And I know in this audience, somebody will have the answer to this. So this particular building, I know it was, it was out of action for, I think it was a couple of years um, after, the, after the 94 earthquake. I don't know if anybody, no, well, anyway, I think it was something like that. This is actually very close to my parents' house too, but I know some of you folks have studied this one. Anyway, so, so it, just, it, it took a long time for repairs to be made, and this was true of many other buildings in the, uh, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, another example would be buildings with foundations that are designed to survive liquefaction and ground failure, but having roads, surrounding roads and infrastructure that are not. So you can have the buildings could survive the earthquake, but they can't really continue to function in serving the role that they serve in, uh, in the city. So the point is that if we want to design structures that not only save lives, but also can continue to support the economic and social functions of the city, then we have to introduce the concept of time in various ways into building standards. So for example, um, to consider the various long-term functions of structures and to prioritize some of those structures that are, are, have, um, are more critical to the functions of the city than others. Um, to consider the long-term durability of structures over time. To have demolition policies that are sensitive to broader community needs than just life safety, so not to be 
too quick to get rid of certain kinds of buildings because they have other important functions to serve over time, in the, again, in the functions of the city. Um, again, to site buildings on lands that won't be disrupted by earthquake shaking um, so they, again, they can continue to do what they're supposed to do. Um, and finally, the importance of lifelines and supporting community functions. And of course, all of these things need to consider not only the next earthquake, but also the earthquake after that. Um, so concluding, um, I suggest the relationships between earthquakes and time can point to ways of thinking about policy, some that are already familiar to us and some that are less familiar. So specifically, I've suggested that earthquake time relationships underlie four particular policy approaches. Um, first, mitigation, which internationally they're um, increasingly calling disaster risk reduction or DRR um, is crucial because earthquakes occur now without any warning. Second, that post-earthquake recovery is a long process. The rebuilding of urban, urban social and economic systems needs to be done thoughtfully and with care, fully involving all stakeholders. And, um, and if, it, if it goes slow because of that, it's okay. Um, and all of this needs to be done intentionally. You need to plan it out ahead of time and, and, and um, provide the resources to do it. Um, third, preparing for and mitigating against the next earthquake is really too narrow of an approach to the earthquake problem. We can more effectively manage long-term earthquake risk by basing our policies on thinking about the earthquake after the next one. Um, and I think this is the essence of the, um, of the idea of resilience. And finally, um, if we want building standards to expand beyond life safety and to address the economic and social life of the city, they need to include the dimension of time, which necessarily includes the broader functions of the city. So again, um, earthquakes, we know, occur in this fleeting instant in time, and we perceive them. We, we, you know, when we think about the next earthquake that's going to come, I think we think about them, we envision them as occurring within our field of vision, within the building that we occupy at the time. I think we all, this is what comes to all of our minds. But they're really much more than this. They affect the urban systems that define our 21st century lives, and our actions to reduce their effects extend for decades before and decades after they occur. And our policies and approaches need to reflect these realities. And that's it. Thank you. So there should be plenty of time for all the hard questions that you've been saving up for me out there. Hi, thank you very much. I was just curious to know if you uh, are familiar with any historical examples or cases of an adequate sort of like democratic process of the involvement of stakeholders as opposed to a series of uh, mishaps and missed opportunities, one could say. And if you could elaborate on what you observed or what you learned about how that process looked like after the disaster involving the stakeholders. Yeah. Because no, I saw I, pictures of like the New Orleans yeah. meeting, public meeting, but there's of course a lot of criticism of how the Bush administration handled and actually exploited the, disaster, the natural disaster for other ends. Yeah, well, there's a lot I can say about New Orleans, but, um, but I won't. Um, but the, um, so there aren't any real shining examples out there. So uh, to some extent, what I'm talking about here is based on all of the things that we, um, that we, keep, we keep thinking that if we respond faster and faster, that it'll, that, that'll work. And, and it actually perversely seems to have the opposite effect. Um, you know, the case from Tamil Nadu, um, I have a doctoral student who, who looked at that, and, and she reported they, they actually, they did some minimal level of public involvement because they, you know, they knew it was important. Uh, the, the World Bank came in and they, um, and they met with key leaders of the villages, um, uh, but they didn't want to spend too much time on it because they knew that time was of the essence, and, and then they rebuilt those things. But it turns out that they didn't always speak to the most representative people in the village, and, um, and they didn't speak to everybody. And besides, everybody was really still traumatized by the disaster, so they weren't really ready to deal with it. Um, anyway, that's another negative example. There's some, there are some positive ones in which we kind of, um, I guess I can, think of, I can think of three, sort of. Um, 
there are things that we sort of learned as we went along. So, um, so New Orleans would be an example. So um, there were a lot of serious missteps, um, and you know, having a more inclusive process came kind of late, um, but it did eventually. And, um, and even that process had detractors, and, and they were all let in. And as more voices were let in, um, it didn't, well, certainly, so it didn't speed things up, but as more voices were let in, um, it reduced a lot, of the, a lot of the discord and has led to some improvements in governance. Um, again, there's still very serious problems in New Orleans, um, but I think, you know, they, 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 they learned a few lessons as they went along. Um, and I would say in Indonesia, so um, in Banda Aceh, which was, of course, just, you know, the most disastrously struck by the tsunami of any place, um, they learned a lot of things as they were going along there. Um, and, and during the process, they, they, they um, uh, learned a lot more about how to do, um, how, to, uh, how to empower the residents to be more involved in um, both allocating the community, the funds for the community as well as to rebuild housing. And two years later, when there was an earthquake in uh, Yogyakarta, Indonesia, um, they, um, they put all of those things to, to work. And the interesting thing is that um, it's often, that example is often touted as a, as a really great example because they rebuilt so many housing units as fast as possible. It was like 200,000 of them in two years. But it was, to me, the achievement was the way that they did it. They, they used substantial, uh, it was sort of based on involvement at the community level. They allocated funds to each community. They let them manage um, both the um, community improvements as well as the, the rebuilding of the houses. And, um, and I, I, you know, I keep looking for critiques of that process. I haven't, there must, I'm sure it wasn't that perfect, but I haven't, I haven't seen anything negative about it. Um, and it was because, it's because they learned those lessons from, uh, from Bonacha. So I guess one of the other lessons here is, the, is uh, what you want to do to really make this stuff work is have a bunch of disasters in a row and, uh, and you can learn the lessons, and you'll get it right eventually. Uh, but anyway, so those are, the, those are the best examples I can think of. Yeah, sure, um, yeah so thanks for the talk. Um, so one thing that came to mind is that there seems to be an inherent tension in uh, having the recovery process begin or, or whatever for it to slow down, um, like you're suggesting, with the fact that stakeholders are going to be leaving all during that time. So, of course, part of your suggestion is to allow more stakeholders to take part, but in fact, you're actually losing stakeholders as you wait. So I just wanted to see what you thought about that. Yeah, well, um, recovery is never going to be easy. Um, you know, we talk about the, um, there's this essential tension between uh, speed and deliberation, and, um, you know, we keep trying to figure out which, you know, what should you do? Should you slow down and deliberate, or should you go as fast as possible? Um, and, uh, you know, one of the conclusions at, at some point in, in, in looking at all this, I concluded that, um, frustratingly, that you actually need to do both. Um, but as we've thought about that, there's, there's ways in which you, well, first of all, there's ways in which you can do both. And one of them has to do with um, uh, getting as much intelligence into the system as possible. So again, recovery is done by, there's lots of different people participating, and, um, and they're all handicapped by the fact that um, you know, things are moving very quickly and nobody knows what everybody else is doing. So you have to set up mechanisms that purposely, um, again, deliberately, flush as much communication and information through the system as possible. I call it widening the bandwidths of communication. And again, that takes intention to do that. And so that you can, so, so on the, you're accepting speed, um, but you're, um, but you're enhancing, you're making, it, you're making this fast process as smart as possible um, by providing, throwing, you know, pushing as much information through it. It's still, it's still going to be imperfect. You're still going to be in daily decisions trading off these things against each other. Um, but that would, be, that, would be, that would be one answer. But the other one is this discovery that, that, that in some of these cases where we, you know, we talk to the people afterwards, and I don't know, maybe they're just saying it, but, but they say that they really would have been happier if we slowed down a little bit and paid more attention to them. And so this is where I say, you know, it's not that I want to slow down. It's that, it's that I want to have um, 
I want to empower the stakeholders more. And you have to really, if you're going to do it, you have to go all in and, and, and make them feel like they're partners. And what happens if you don't? It, uh, it spreads um, uh, mistrust. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they don't trust these decisions that are going on too fast behind closed doors. And by opening it up and having more of them involved, they're, they're actually more tolerant of it taking a little, little, little bit more time as long as they know um, they know why. And I guess I'll throw it, I was just talking to Rich before, the, 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 the metaphor that I use on this is the, um, think of, so we've had a big disaster and we're, we're sitting in the, in the castle and the peasants are all out there with the torches and the pitchforks and they're, you know, and they're storming the castle and they want us to rebuild as fast as possible. And um, the reaction is, let's say, these guys, they're distracting us. So what we need to do is we need to close the doors and close all the windows, and we need to sit here and draw all the plans. Um, and then we'll go out and you know, we'll fight our way through the crowd and we'll build as fast as possible, and they'll be happy in the end. And so many of these cases show that, in fact, they're not happy in the end. And they're really, and they concoct all kinds of you know, rumors about all the things they imagined that happened behind those closed doors. Um, so trust becomes a really big problem. And so I think you just have to open up those doors and windows and bring those torches and pitchforks in. I know it's kind of it's theoretical, um, but, you know, the, it, it, all my experiences say that, that that's going to be the way that's going to make it better and that people will be more satisfied in the end, and it might slow things down a bit to do so. Cool. Uh, just one follow-up. Okay. And I know this is hard uh, in your field to measure these kinds of things, but is there any evidence that actually getting community involvement keeps locals staying there for longer, waiting for recovery to occur? You know what I mean? As opposed yeah. to just leaving. Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, and I'd ha I, don't, I, don't, I don't know of anything, of anything that looks at that, and, I, I, I'll, and I'll think about that one in a while, too. Thanks. Hi, Rob. My name's Margot. The um, photo you showed up there of Christchurch and the dust storm, I was in the middle of that, and your comment about you need to survive multiple experiences to know what it's like. We had uh, six, um, five-plus earthquakes in less than 12 months. Uh, and so pr practical reality of trying to slow things down, the um, cultural and heritage community, so the asset owners of churches, theatres, etc., the, the, the old buildings, the heritage buildings, were actually incentivised to speed up because of their insurance policies and also because of the threat of the, um, the increasing building codes which were likely to come their way. Those who haven't sp um, gone fast have had exactly that problem. They now have to build a very high code, which is unaffordable. We tried to slow it down, but there was no way to fund that pause. So the building owners were responsible for bringing their own buildings down, but the communities wanted those buildings to stay. Have you got any solutions to how you fund that pause? How we fund? The fund the pause. Fund the slowing down. Oh, um, so, so one of the other issues, um, so, so one of the, one of the costs of slowing down, and maybe this kind of gets at the previous question too, is that um, some people some people are able to um, to uh, have more tolerance for the delay. So uh, basically, the um, people who have fewer resources, so uh, lower income households, small businesses. Um, they they can't just sit around and wait for it. They don't they don't have other resources to help them to help them get through. And so um, to me, something it's something that I don't, we don't do we don't do well in the U.S. at all is to um, is to uh, purposely um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but basically um, uh, preferentially make more resources available to those who. It's a problem that we have in general, making more resources available to those who don't have enough. Um, and, 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 and so, I mean, yes, we need to do that. And, that's, and that's, how we can, that's how we can prevent some of those problems that might happen in slowing down. Um, so I'm not talking about the lower income. I'm talking about the cultural and heritage fabric of cities, yeah. the cathedrals, the theatres. San Francisco, my first visit here, I, I look at your buildings and I despair 
to the amount of buildings that are likely to fall down which have cultural and, and, and community value. The decision around the pushing that building down lies with the building owner. Right. They are incentivized to hurry. Okay, so, so to, to, provide resource, to provide financial resources yep. to them. To, to allow to them to, to slow down. Yeah. We've lost 80% of our heritage buildings in Christchurch because we do not blame the owners because that was what their insurance policy required and also to delay increases their costs. So you, there's no blame, but looking forward, we wonder what the rest of you with cities, with cultural fabric that you all in your heart feel as part of your city. As you said, your city still lives there. You, you still live there, but you don't own it. So you actually have no right to make those decisions to slow it down. Somehow you have to work out how to fund that pause and we haven't yet found that solution. I've been in New York with Rockefeller and the World Bank and the UN. There is no answer. So I'm wondering in the research community, are you thinking about how you would fund the pause? Yeah. So, I, no. I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe somebody else here has an idea. But it's really kind of a variant of what I was just saying, which is that, which is that there are some, some, some uses, some, um, uh, again, some users, some... I'm not going to call them earthquake victims. Anyway, there, there, there are, are um, for some uses, um, we need to, they, they can't tolerate the, the delay for whatever reason. And we do need to think consciously about having policies to provide funding for those kinds of uses, for the historic resources, for small businesses, for all of those kinds of things that can't tolerate delay. And, and it's just that they, it's not that they can't tolerate the, extra delays that I've talked about that might come from deliberation, they can't tolerate any delay at all. They can't even, they can't even tolerate the delay involved in, in you know, having policies that are aimed at trying to rebuild things as quickly as possible. So I agree. I mean, I think that's, I think that's a big need. And those, that's, those, those are some of the things that we need to be thinking about before the next one. Uh, to play off of what you just said there and what she said is I think we need to have a game plan in a, available before the earthquake. Uh, a lot of cities, city of Berkeley is one, that focuses on recovery, I mean, not recovery, uh, just response. They talk about mitigation, but uh, nothing is done about planning for recovery. And we need to start this discussion with the heritage uh, community early. Otherwise, we will get locked up in a process where nothing gets done because we have been afraid to talk about these issues beforehand. So I, I think that the secret is we need to start talking about some of these issues now. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's what I was uh, trying to um, emphasize here, is the idea of, of uh, preparing, thinking about not just doing a scenario for what's going to happen immediately after the next earthquake, but to look at what's going to happen during the weeks, months, years after the next earthquake. And in doing that, that's inevitably, inevitably going to help us to think about things that we need to do now in order to better prepare for that process. So... Right. And uh, the, the fabric of a community are the cultural relationships, the personal relationships, the financial relationships, and those are all disrupted by a sudden onset event. And how do you stabilize all of those relationships, which are the essence of a city, so that you can go through this timely, timely and time-taking process of recovery? Because I think they've that you, you have this dynamic of people want shelter, they want these relationships reestablished, and at the same time you want to rebuild uh, with resilience in mind. Right. Well, um, the thing is um, one, one entity doesn't build the city and one entity isn't going to rebuild the city. So as I said, there's a lot of different actors. I was focusing on some of the roles of government. Um, but they're just one of the many actors. So I know when you were in your role here, um, you were certainly um, 
had a lot of responsibility for um, coordinating a lot of the immediate response kinds of activities. But as, as it started going into recovery, you know, you, it, had you been so fortunate as to be in your position when the really big one happens, um, you wouldn't, um, you, you would be far from the, from the czar as that recovery was going on. You would just be one of the players, um, and maybe even a, a small player, but a small but important player, and that's what some of this advice is, is for. Um, but, but yeah, the, the things are, the city, the city, it's a self-organizing system made of all the different actors in it, um, and government is just one of them. Uh, Rob, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, what would be your comments or your assessments on the recovery of San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake and fire? Um, what would be my comments on that? The, um, from what I... What? Yeah, go ahead. From what I know about, so go ahead. Well, I mean, the Burnham, Daniel Burnham had, as I'm sure you know, had developed a city beautiful plan for San Francisco in 1905 and had these great vistas and boulevards and everything. The city was burned down to the ground. It was a tabula rasa, uh, practically, you know, as, at least the downtown area was. Um, it recovered very quickly. Uh, if you look at the photographs of San Francisco in 1907 and 8, it's, it's astounding how fast it was rebuilt. Um, they totally ignored Burnham's plan. Uh, Dowdy analyzed this in the 60s in the PhD thesis and found existing pattern of land ownership constrained everything. Mm. We look at San Francisco today, we have, you can argue about its, well, I'll leave it there. Yeah, well, so part is, is it's not. It's not a tabula rasa, um, and you and you just answered your own question uh, as to. Anyway. Yeah. 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 I mean, because because it's it's not. So um, so after after big disaster after this earthquake, it increases the um, possibility of making some significant changes, um, but it doesn't. It, there's still all the different interests and forces going on, and um, as I said, you know these things—they're they're, not—they're not blank maps. All this—all the different competing interests are there. All the different ownership interests are there. The city still exists. It just doesn't look like it does. So I'm sure there were good reasons why they didn't want to do the Burnham plan beforehand, um, and those reasons continue to exist. Now, the 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 possibility of some part of that plan being implemented. Um, increased incrementally in some way after the disaster, but even that probably apparently wasn't enough to do any parts. Were there any parts of it done at all? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, there was other things that were done. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Olshansky, and we can continue the discussion upstairs in the reception. Thank you, everyone, for Good, coming. Thanks.